I hope you guys had a great week and weekend. And I wanted to, well, a couple of things um, that I wanted to do. I wanted to look at the research and discovery projects that have been turned in just for a little bit. And then, I'm sorry, I'm fiddling around with my stuff on my screen so I can show you what I'm seeing. And then I wanted to um, revisit the, the whole thing about um, the tools of artistic critique. And I wanted to, and then we'll go into our stuff today. Let's see. All right. Now, both of you guys have uh, either of you, Ryan or America, have either of you done the second discovery project for this class? What are you thinking about doing for the second discovery project? Um, I'm thinking about cooking something this time around. All right. Where where are you getting your inspiration for the cooking? Um, oh, I can't remember if it was De Las Casas or De Soto, but they made some descriptions of um, Aztec food that are pretty similar to our Tex-Mex. And I thought it would be fun to try and... Um, combine ingredients to to make something good um <clears throat> and then i have some other ideas in the pipe too in case that ends up being a disaster because my last research project didn't end up the way i wanted it to so backups to the backups <laughs> well what i would recommend to tie this fully into the class is to because you know, those guys fairly squint with, uh, fit within the time frame of this class, 1350 to today. What I would do is see if you could find uh, any sort of the, the artwork that the, the Spanish monks were doing, because they did a lot of imagery of um, what the Aztecs were like. You know, they, they, they did a lot of paintings and drawings of what the Aztecs were like. Or um, if you can find any paintings from that time, too, in this, from the Spanish court, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella had had done had commissioned paint, um, uh, bringing over people from from the Americas to do cooking for them. And there are some paintings that exist showing some of that food, and that that might be really interesting. You know, just we haven't covered anything like that specifically, and we don't in this class, but it fits in the time frame. And if you can find that European type of stuff. That'd be awesome. Um, another potential connection is that uh, when we get into Baroque, which is, I think, in, in next week or the week after, something like that, uh, during the Baroque era, the uh, indigenous American woodcarvers were doing Christian saints, Christian iconography in wood carving, and they were the best uh, woodcarvers in the Western Hemisphere. So you, you could not count yourself a noble or royal um, who's it or what's it in Europe without having saint carvings from one of the Baroque masters in Mexico. And it might be, and we do cover some of that in the, the Baroque module, and it might be interesting just to, to look up some of those guys and say, oh, this guy came was living in Mexico City, and this is the kind of cooking that people did who founded the original Mexico City in Tenochtitlan, you know, that, that would, that would, I think that would justify as a tie-in. So, you know, any, anything like that. The, the biggest thing about the project is making sure that it fits in our time frame. Second biggest thing, and probably most important, is uh, making sure that it ties directly somehow to subject matter of the class. And the easiest thing is if you can find imagery that fits within that time frame that shows something that you can uh, claim ties into your project. I, I think that's that's perfect. And you know, if if there's any doubt, um, pull it out of your ear. 
<laughs> or or ask me, and I, I I'm really good at BS. I mean, um, I'm really good at academic justification. So, how about you, America? What are you What are you looking at for your next project? I'm not entirely sure, but I think I might want to do something about like covering the art from the re from last week's module about the Ottomans artwork. That that could be really, really cool. And what some of the things that I've seen is there was somebody who actually did a report on floriography where they trace where it went from the Ottoman court to France to Victorian England. And then they talked a little bit about William Morris uh, wallpaper designs and how that directly related to the floriography from the Ottoman court. That might be kind of interesting. Or... I, I think it was Ryan. Ryan, didn't you do something on calligraphy on mulberry leaves for your weekly reflection? Was that you? That was not me, but that's actually one of my backups that <clears throat> I've thought about doing. I I have a uh, uh, a couple calligraphy sets. I have a um, late European one, and I have a uh, Persian one. That that both of those I I think would be really interesting. There is a lot of crossover in um, the calligraphy culture with uh, Persia and Turkey, uh, Ottoman Turkey. And a uh, big reason for that is that um, there's always been this kind of um, sibling relationship um, since the life of Rumi, because Rumi was both Persian and Turkish. And I, I, that, that's kind of a, a fun thing to explore there. It's whenever I hear Persian reflections on writing uh, Rumi writings or Rumi sayings. It's always fun because it's a slightly different perspective than the Turkish ones. And it, it, I, a friend of mine does um, Rumi translation and he he's lived all over the world, but he is from Persia. And then um, my uh, I have an adopted brother who uh, he and his wife are from Turkey. And it, it's fun to put those two guys in a room together. <laughs> to, to see how, how they're thinking. But yeah, I think America, whatever you do, America, I, I think it, um, judging from what you were doing last year, I, I think it'll be really cool. All right, folks, let's, um, I am going to uh, just revisit a little bit of, let's see, I want to, I want to find something that we can, we can look at. Okay, here we go. And I want to just revisit the four steps of artistic critique um, because that is, as we move on to the class, I, I will keep reiterating this for the next couple of weeks. And then after that, you guys are gonna be reiterating it back to me because it will become such a part of, uh, almost a reflective, a reflexive part of what you do when you encounter art objects um, or art artifacts. When we look at art, I, I think one of the one of the problems that I have is do you guys have an idea of or do you guys know what the average uh, attention span of a goldfish is? Probably more than ours at this point. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I read an article a few years ago that the average attention span of a goldfish is about 9.2 seconds. You know what the average art, uh, attention span of a 20-year-old college student is? It's 4.2 seconds. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, you were pretty close. Um, and in the 50s, there was um, an art critic that I really, I, I don't feel that his I, I don't think that his conclusions are, are justifiable. But he said that if you don't get, he said essentially, if you don't get the art in a second, it's not worth your time. And you know, keep in mind this is in the 50s. And the 50s is the decade that really gave us our contemporary understanding of consumer culture. They are the ones that produced. They're the ones that the, the 50s is the era that produced um, designed obsolescence. 
They're the ones that started producing the idea that every model year for a car had to be different, had to be new, had to be futuristic. They're, that's the one where we get a, a lot of the advertising models that are still used today, you know, where you're not a good enough person if you don't have it, you're not pretty enough if you don't have it, nobody will like you if you don't have it. You know, God doesn't even like you if you don't have it, that, that kind of idea. And um, the, the momentary satisfaction concept, I think, was really birthed as we understand it in the 50s. And so I, I, I think that very much he was a product of his time when he said that. But most of the art things that we encounter I think remind me of an experience. This is anecdotal. And so um, I, I believe that something like this happened, whether or not this exact exchange did happen. But a, a woman from the US visiting Europe happened to realize that in the cafe that she was sitting down in, a couple of tables over was Picasso. And she grabbed a napkin and she went over and said, whatever you draw on this napkin, I'm, I'm happy, you know, I want, I want something that Picasso has made. Would you mind doing something? So he, he said, sure. So he scribbled on the, the napkin, gave it to her and said, that's $10,000. And she said, well, it only took you a second. And Picasso supposedly said, but I've been Picasso for 40 years. And I, I, I thought about that and the reason why I'm bringing this up is the objects that survive, the objects that we encounter, or the objects that we see as art objects, they aren't indicative of a moment of time. They are evidence, sometimes of a lifetime, but at the very uh, many times they're evidence of at least a significant amount of effort. So we may encounter them briefly, see them in a museum, walk by them. But whatever that is, that, that uh, pair of moccasins made by a Yakima Nation uh, auntie you know, for, for her niece 150 years ago may have taken her three months to make. And we, we see it and you know, we in, um, encounter it over a span of maybe a second or two. And what I like about these tools of artistic critique is that they help us to slow down for a bit and focus our attention expand our attention span, uh, at least enough, hopefully, to pay uh, some respect to the process of creation. But I think also to show our respect by taking the time to begin the process of appreciation. And so, you know, most of the artifacts that we look at, most of the art that we look at, like if it's an oil painting, maybe it was painted over the course of a month. If it's a carving, maybe the carving took years to do. And we encounter it. What we're seeing is the result of somebody spending a lifetime learning and practicing their craft and getting better and better. So I, I want to look at something and revisit the, the four tools of artistic critique. When I do the screen share, most of the time I, I can't see your faces. So feel free to. Um, Say something if I don't respond to your hand. OK, this is called the, the Compassionate Breath or Divine Breath. This is a pointed star. This particular ones are, come from a, a museum in Persia. When I went to this museum, what was amazing to me is how many variations there are of these stars. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate the, the, the four tools of artistic critique with this thing. Um, what do you guys remember what the first tool, first step is? It starts, it starts with a D. Description. Description, exactly. So describing this, when I saw these, if I remember right, they're about six to eight inches across, maybe a little bit smaller, but, but around there. They're, they're made out of clay. It's not a typical terracotta. It's a clay that's a little bit wider. And it looks like it's incised. And then something is 
pushed into the incision to make it a little bit darker. That, 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 that's what it looks like. I don't, don't know if that's how it's made, but these darker areas are recessed a little bit and the whiter clay is up above. Um, this one that my mouse is, is on, is an eight, it's an eight pointed star. And um, it's set next to this, this cross, this diagonal cross. And I, I think that this is, I think a uh, Christian description is uh, St. Andrew's cross where it's diagonal. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. But then these are placed together so that they, they feel like they, they interlock. And the colors vary in range, but they're, they're warmer colors. It's a, a, a lighter clay body, and the colors range from this ochre to, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, an ochre, an umber, to kind of a red. That I, I, I think it's really very warm and engaging. And the elements seem to be abstracted floral with uh, calligraphy going around the border. All right, so that, that's a description. And what I, I'm trying to do is limit it to sharing my en engagement of the senses when I encounter this kind of object. And th that's what I'm trying to limit the description to. What's the next step? America, do you remember the next, the second step? It starts with an A. Analyze. Yes, very much. And that's when I should start talking about things like incising. It, it feels to me like the, the, the clay is made into a slab. Probably then it's cut to shape. But then it looks like to me that the calligraphy is incised in. And the background around these floral elements is smushed in a little bit, textured a bit. And that's what perhaps the the colorant is rubbed into. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if I'm wrong about that and maybe this is painted with a, a wax and then covered with a, a, a darker material that, that soaks into all the areas that aren't covered with the wax and then it appears that it's fired again. Um, it looks like it's done by hand, you know, that, that a model is used to give the overall size and shape. And then in the pro just in the process of making, maybe it, it, the size flexes a little bit. But it, it does feel very, very hand processed. There is a very strong geometry to everything, but it, it feels to me that it is, it's important that it's done by hand because you can see that this border around the star, there's areas where it's a lot more uneven like here, it's a little bit wider. Over here, it's a little bit narrower. But it, it does feel have that, that personal touch feeling to it. All right, so what's, what's the third? So in that, I'm try, trying to extrapolate, trying to guess how the artist made it. And then, Ryan, what's the third step? It starts with an I. Interpret. Interpret. And this is... This can be problematic, but you're engaging a lot more of your imagination. And you're kind of extrapolating from where this was found, what you see, how, how it relates, what you, um, kind of the internal conversation you have with an imaginary avatar of the person making it. What, what could it possibly mean? You know, and this is not, we're not having a definitive answer for what, definitely what it means. And I think that if there's no personal engagement with anybody that was present at the time of its making, it's a lot more difficult to pronounce precisely what it, how, you know, what it means. Um, unless the, the person who created it is able to leave you a record of what they thought when they made it. And even then, that's still one possible interpretation. Andy Warhol was rare, very good at that. He was um, a Rosicrucian, Andy Warhol was, uh, just like if, um, he was Klein. And uh, a lot of the times, the things that he said to the media, the things that he, how he responded when people would ask him about his art is not what he actually felt about his art. And you get a better record of that with people, the other artists like Ultraviolet that lived with him and worked with him, or his nephews, his nephew that would come and visit with him and talk about stuff. That's where you get a little bit more honest engagement about what his art meant. But barring that, what, um, 
looking at this, I, I think I can imagine a little bit about, you know, this person is making something that looks like it is produced for a wider audience than a singular person. These tiles are made with something of a pattern. So I, I think that they are made to, to be used by people, which means that um, perhaps this isn't a sacred object, but it is an object that is designed for people to use in a space they want to feel comfortable in. Um, this particular form is called the divine breath or the compassionate breath. There's a passage in the, um, this calligraphy is written in Arabic. And so I, I'm thinking this is a reference to the Quran and Islam. In the Quran, there are several times when it's recorded that Gabriel said to Muhammad, with every breath, um, God considers his creation. And so um, in uh, mystical Islam and traditional Islam, the idea of this eight-pointed star has become associated with an inhale or an exhale. And then the cross has been, actually, I believe that this is an inhale and the cross has been associated with the exhale and it represents every breath, you know, the, the constant breathing of God as a metaphor for the fact that God is always aware and is always concerned with compassion, um, you know, in, in the realm of compassion with his creation. And so, so this, this pattern became ubiquitous in um, homes as well as uh, religious structures throughout Islam for much of its history. And I, I think that we can kind of justify that a little bit. I can't read this calligraphy there, but it is um, calligraphy is important to this society and this kind of building because it reminds somebody of that connection with that divine quality of retaining knowledge and the, the um, sacred sayings that remind us of our um, connection with divinity. And these stylized plants are, um, they're stylized and patterned perhaps to remind us that there is this idea of an ideal realm somewhere where beautiful things happen and beautiful things are and an association with the heavenly realm to give us hope that, um, you know, passing through life, things can be better and we can help things to be better. And it's interesting to me that these crosses are, very, are, are similar, but these stars, the three stars here are very different. And the, these crosses are very different. And you can even see the center of this one is different from that. So even though the message is, is consistent, that there's this idea of a celebrated space that we can hope for, there's also a, a, an image that, or an idea that things can be different and it's okay for things to be different. They don't always have to be identical. It, it allows for a different interpretation and, and personality. And, you know, and I, I'm drawing from my own extrapolation, but I'm also drawing from the, the experience that I had with people that I've talked to, remembering my encounter with the curator of the museum where I saw these and, um, you know, what his, what his beliefs were and another curator, what her beliefs about it were. Uh, she was actually an anthropologist that helped to recover some of these and restore some of them. And uh, and whether or not we have personal encounters with the art um, art objects that we see, it's it's still that idea of interpretation involves a lot of imagination, you know, and, and memories and associations that we make. And then what's the fourth step, America? What's what's the what's the fourth step of artistic critique? It starts with an E. Evaluate. Yes, absolutely. Is it successful? I think the fact that this is these, I believe if I remember right, the display I was looking at where I saw some of these, they are done in um, a luster on uh, uh, light bodied clay. And that was most popular between the seventh and 11th centuries. So I, you know, these are about a thousand years old. I would guess 
which makes me believe that these are, you know, from a physical standpoint, very successful. How many people do you know have been around for a thousand years? <laughs> so from that point, but the, the fact that there are so many of these and they were, um, it seems to me that they were beloved because so many of them do survive. It also communicates that there is a, a realm of success, you know, a certain element of success. The fact that people still respond to this in some of these areas um, where these have been found a thousand years later, the fact that people still respond to this kind of artwork tells me that it, it was successful. It's still a lot of that, the meaning that people associate with it is still around and still connected and uh, people still treasure these objects. So I, I believe that they, they are successful. So, um, and, and we can see a lot of this kind of stuff surviving through time. And I think that that gives us a, a way that we can um, judge or evaluate its successfulness, but also how other people react to it and still react to it, maybe, how we're reacting to it. I, I think all those. Uh, now, if you put these in a decor shop at Target, would they be successful? I would, I would probably argue no. You know, people going to Target, if they want handmade, what they want, what they mean is they want it to have the consistent dependency of machine made, but with minor flaws in it that can be blamed on a human hand. So they have the illusion that it was handcrafted. That, <laughs> you know, that, that seems to be what the market wants today. But for producing for the market at that time, a thousand years ago, I think that these were very successful. Whether or not you, you agree with me in that assessment, I don't really care. That's mostly a, de a demonstration just of the process of those four tools of artistic critique. Description, analysis, interpretation, and evaluation. This is something that I think you guys will find will become habitual. You won't even realize you're doing it until about Halloween. And then you'll start seeing Halloween decoration. And you'll go like this or you'll go like that. And you say, man, they could have done better. <laughs> and when somebody says, what do you mean? You say, well, I don't like the fact that those two skeletons, they look so fake and they're pointing at each other when they should be pointing at the central theme, which is this over here. And it's just using all the same uh, really poorly crafted tombstones to decorate your yard. You should be, you know, you're, you're trying to communicate to people. You're uh, developing a completely different um, environment. And I, I, I just think you could have done better. That's that, and it's going to be so annoying to the people who know you. <laughs> but you, but you know, that that's a good thing if when you're studying art history. Anyway, have have you guys experienced any any awareness of how you interact with new things? Uh, I, I, you know, a difference in how you interact with new things, because and that you can attribute to. A, a building awareness of those tools of artistic critique. And I'll ask this question again in about a month and a half. But uh, the, the point is to narrow your focus, to maintain your focus, and to, I think, demonstrate respect for somebody else's workmanship and spending a little bit of time trying to appreciate what they did. And I, I, I think that's a really good th way to look at it. But also critique relates directly to critical. And when we're being critical, it's come to mean being nasty and harsh and, and evil. But what it actually should mean is intentional. And when we think intentionally, I, that's, that's the thing that will save, that saves a society, is when people think things through and think intentionally. How many bad decisions have you made in the spur of the moment when you're terrified or when you panic? That's where most of our bad decisions come from. Or, you know, uh, when you first wake up in the morning and you're still really groggy, that, that's good too. But when do your good decisions come? Your good decisions come when you are thinking things through. When you take a step back, you, you still make decisions emotionally, but you're able to at least qualify and articulate why 
you've made the decision. And I think that that's, that's one of the reasons why the Dalai Lama said the single most important skill for people to develop today in today's society is the skill of critical thinking. And, you know, that's what the tools of artistic critique support. Anyway, today, so in the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about a number of different things. We've been talking about the Renaissance, Italian Renaissance, Northern Renaissance. We've been talking about the Mughals in India, and we've been talking about Otto, the Ottomans. And these people overlap quite a bit from about uh, end of the, the 15th century throughout the, the 16th century. And I want this time, we're, this week, we're just going to look at where I think we can see some of that cross pollination and evidence. And I, I hope this, um, again, whether or not you agree with, with, with what I'm concluding, that's fine. But I think that as you look at stuff with these two perspectives, that there was cross pollination, that there was most likely cross pollination, and with the, the tools of artistic critique, I think you will find evidence that there is cross pollination. Okay, th this is a painting that was commissioned, I believe this is about 15th, 16th century. And it marks, uh, I think it was Mark in um, Alexandria. So this is supposed to be the Library of Alexandria. And um, if we talk about, and, and that, you know, if we fly the first uh, tool of artistic critique description, this is supposed to be Mark speaking to a population of living people. What is the first thing that you see is wrong? There's, there's several things that are wrong. First thing is, Mark was alive 2,000 years ago. This kind of architecture was nowhere on the planet 2,000 years ago. How many people wore Ottoman turbans, Ottoman-style turbans 2,000 years ago? How many people wore... Um, Eastern Orthodox Christian headwear 2,000 years ago. That was birthed um, 400 years later after Mark had died, horrible, gruesome, terrible, painful death um, after Constantine had moved over to Turkey. <laughs> so there's a lot of anachronisms here. So what, is that, what does that tell us off the bat? What can we, I'm, I'm gonna switch this so you can see a bigger picture of the painting. What does that tell us about the purpose of the painting? Or what does that communicate? It seems like it was made for a particular audience. Yeah, absolutely. It was made for a particular audience. And what and as, as we look at this a little bit closer, we know that this is supposed to be Mark. And the reason why we can deduce that is if we uh, if you um, if we look at I, the rules of iconography, and attribution or attributes, you know, all the, the the saints have specific attributes associated with them, so that everybody can identify them in the paintings, regardless of the skill level of the painter or the carver or, or whoever. And so we we know that this is Saint Mark. We know that this is Saint um, Alexandria, and we know it's Alexandria because that's the title of the painting, the Sermon of Saint Mark in Alexandria. But we can. Um, do you remember when we looked at the painting, Do You Speak Renaissance? They're using a lot of the same kind of tropes, where you have this, this vaguely Egyptian style architecture. And it is designed, you know, especially this, these kinds of forms here are designed to remind you of Egypt. And then, of course, you have the tree here. Remember that, that painting that we saw um, of Madonna and Child? They use the same, that painter used the same kinds of things to place the activity in the Middle East or in the Holy Land. And that's what's going on. 
you know, St. Mark is supposed to be in Alexandria, which is in Egypt. Now we have back here, these guys are wearing stuff that was not in vogue when Mark was alive. These are the, the school, the particular school of people that commissioned the painting. And if, um, if you zoom in, and we had a really clear image of the painting, you could see these are all faces of people that had their individual portraits done when this artist was commissioned to do the painting. So they, he made sure that they could recognize their faces in the painting that he did. And Mark is the patron saint of Alexandria, but he's also the patron saint of uh, Venice, I believe. And there is a, um, a story that his Mark's bones were smuggled out of Alexandria and brought to Venice, uh, wrapped in a carcass of a pig so that nobody else would mess with it. And um, the, 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 the artist is reminding everybody who's in the know that this apostle kind of lends um, vitality, credibility, and, um, oh, what's another word? Veracity to the school of the cardinals that commissioned the painting. And then if we, we look around here, you know, the, we see the Eastern Orthodox, you know, at one point the, both the Catholic Pope and the Eastern Orthodox Pope had excommunicated each other. And what we're kind of seeing is, would you say that these guys are looking proud, prideful, or do you think they're a little subservient to these guys? You know, just the Eastern Orthodox guys are mostly on their knees, and the cardinals, the Catholic cardinals, are all standing up. And, you know, we, we look around with, we have uh, different groups, like over here. This is a slightly different style turban than the Ottoman style turban here. We get, uh, you know, some fezes, you know, Moroccan style head headgear, and I, I, you know, we can we can keep looking at it, and we get this fantastic giraffe. But what the artist is communicating, I think, or one of the, the things the artist is communicating, is that there is an exchange of culture between Italy or among Italy, North Africa, uh, Turkey. Uh, further, you know, spaces further east. Um, and he's kind of honoring that in a way, but he's also reminding everybody in the know that even though this is supposed to be taking place in North Africa, is you know, the Catholic cardinals that commissioned the painting, their school is in the ascendancy. So, it, you know, it, it, which, which is interesting to me because looking at this painting, there's a lot of stuff going on. But it, I think it demonstrates an awareness of cross-cultural connections. And it also demonstrates just a, you know, a not so subtle reminder that um, these guys want to be considered to be in or you want everybody to remember that they're in charge. And there's other paintings that, that ha give similar messages, but, um, I, I wanted to re, to remind people, you know, bring us back to you know, this is the world that's that's going on. At as the Crusades came to a close, that's where we find the birth of the Renaissance in Europe. But what's interesting to me is you also get a lot of stabilized trade. That Italy is pretty much not, if not controlling, they are right on top of. That uh, Turkey is right on top of that Egypt is, is aware of and it has their hand in it. But all these cultures are finding that as they connect with each other in uh, peaceable trade and uh, mercantile and, and commerce, they are gaining an awful lot. And in that process, they're also learning from each other. And I think uh, we can see that there, I think that we can see that art is expanding, architecture is expanding, people are growing from that cross-cultural cross-pollination. And uh, talk a little bit about the Renaissance. You know, the Renaissance came because everybody got back from, from war and stuff like that. And uh, they're, they're trying to rediscover 
or expand on the things that they just uh, learned or encountered during their travel away. And do you remember the Mughals? One of the, the amazing things about the Mughals, what made, what were some of the things that made them so incredibly wealthy? Uh, having an open society where people can uh, cooperate. Yeah. Yeah, they, they connected. Um, they were connecting basically Transoxiana to China and they were right on the spice route there. And they were finding ways to uh, connect and cohabitate. Um, how about the Ottomans? What, what made them so fabulously wealthy? Controlling the uh, the the trade between Europe and Asia. That well, what's it called? The Hellespont. That little narrow strait. Oh yeah, right by the the Bosporus. Yeah, that that, that whole area there. Oh, Bosporus. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, and that's um, what's interesting to me is that Turkey connect is. Uh, the, a real meeting place between the overland routes going from Eastern Europe to Asia. Um, India is a cultural melting pot from a lot, lot of the stuff from China, principally into the Middle East. And then Italy, it finds its way itself in a perfect spot to really have its fingers in all the trade throughout the Mediterranean connecting um, North Africa, Western Africa, and, um, and uh, the Middle East. So all these three communities that we've looked at are all uh, perfectly situated to become wealthy through the, the, a process that results in cultural cross-pollination, you know, finding peaceable alternatives um, to warfare and finding the wonderful growth that can come out of um, uh, trade with all these different groups. Now, you guys remember uh, remember this image? Uh, who who's the artist that made this? Anybody? Da Vinci. Da Vinci. And I'm going to be this. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some ideas more than artifacts in this um, class. This is called, this is referenced as the Vitruvian man. Have either of you heard of Vitruvius before? Or that term, Vitruvian man? I've heard the term. I haven't heard of the individual. Okay, there was, um, there was a Army Corps of Engineers dude who became an architect, just like me, Marcinon, but for the Romans, and his name was Vitruvius. And he felt very strongly that the spaces that we li should live with, um, the spaces that we live within are most comfortable, most sheltering, and most nurturing when they mirror the functions of the human body. And this goes to an idea that is common to all three of these cultures that we looked at as well. Um, it is called um, the microcosm, macrocosm model of the universe, where you get um, as above, so below, where the, the things on earth represent what, they, what you see in heaven and the heavens can reflect what we see on earth. For Christians, this is justified through Genesis where um, God says, I think it's in, I wanna say the first chapter, but it might be the second, where it says that um, God placed lights in the sky to communicate to, to humans, essentially, what was going on. So, you know, and it's a direct reference to this idea that the alchemists later took and that um, uh, Renaissance Christians modeled uh, about this idea that the heavens reflect human life and then human life should reflect the, the models that, that God establishes um, in a spiritual realm. For um, Plato, he talks about this quite a bit in The Republic where he talks about uh, his definitions of the ideal realm or the world of the real. This is where we get the allegory of the cave. 
that uh, the heavenly realm is reflected poorly in the physical realm, that nature is a manifestation of God's will and that art imitates nature by being a manifestation of human will. Um, as, as a lower tone um, uh, model of that same relationship between nature, nature and God. And in Islam, it's this, the same kind of thing where it's um, God lives in this kind of uh, supernal realm. And they, since most, um, since uh, Muslim scholars are very well aware of the writings of the Romans and the Greeks, uh, that I, uh, Plato's discussion of the, the ideal realm became a model for them as well. We, and all of that is, is I, th I think, very interesting, but I, I think we can see a lot of connection with how these different groups viewed um, the world and viewed the, the times that they lived within because those kinds of models for world thinking were shared among all of them. But uh, anyway, going back to Vitruvius, he wrote 10 books on architecture that I would really recommend you guys to look up and read. It's 10 books on architecture by Vitruvius, very original title. And um, this image that we see, let's see, I'm going to share the screen again. What um, Da Vinci is demonstrating is a relationship of the human form with, on one hand, the structure of the universe, but also the geometry being used to create generate architecture and the spaces that we live within. It's called the Vitruvian Man because it shows the human form with the geometry around it, and it's almost always a square in a circle. What is really interesting about this particular thing, if you look at where the corners of the circle intersect, I mean, the corners of the square intersect the circle. What is fascinating about this is that the perimeter of the square, those four sides, is identical to the perimeter of the circle, the circumference of the circle. That's fascinating because it's relatively easy to do that with today's technology. It is very difficult to do that with the straight edge and uh, compass technology available to people at the time, but they figure out how to do it anyway. I, I just think that that's fascinating. But it does demonstrate a uh, higher order understanding of mathematic, mathematics and geometry that we think we understand specifically because of the digital age. There's some other things going on that I think are really interesting, and you see these, these shapes of rectangles going through. What do you think the proportions are that Da Vinci is working with, with those different rectangles. Have you guys ever heard of something called the golden section or the golden ratio? This is one to 1.618. Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician, um, described this in whole numbers with his Fibonacci sequence. And what's fascinating about that is that it also describes not just the proportions of, for example, uh, the facial recognition modeling software, that's used by all sorts of different governmental agencies is uh, when that model, that software is developed in the early stages of development, one of the things they discovered very quickly is that golden ratio, even though no single person demonstrates those proportions in their human form, like we talked, um, the aggregate or the average of humans does. If you take you know 3D model rendering rendering of human forms, and you take that 3D average, uh, we all fall into the the golden section ratio, or that go the golden ratio, which I think is fascinating. And that is why uh, the the Greek and Roman sculptures look so superhumanly beautiful to our perspectives is because. Uh, Organizations like Pew Charitable Trust have been able to demonstrate that our visceral reactions to beauty and visual balance are directly related to how whatever we encounter relates the golden ratio. Isn't that interesting? So when, when we don't think about it, 
that's what we respond to. And you know, it, you look at what Da Vinci has done with the face. You know, this is a golden section ratio rectangle. You know, and then these the proportions are are based on those kinds of fundamental proportions. And I I, I think that that's really interesting. Um, some other other things. The reason why I'm kind of focusing on on this a little bit is if we do diagrams where we look at golden ratios and we put them over things like Mughal architecture, um, Ottoman era architecture, portraiture, things like that, how they built the books, how they built their furniture, even though the furniture books and architecture is very different. And you guys can tell right now if something's Mughal, if it's Ottoman, if it's Renaissance. But even though it's very different, they are still using those same ratio and proportions, which I, I think is fascinating. Vitruvius, his architecture, even though this is a Vitruvian man and it was very big in Europe, you still see that same kind of thing showing up in, in these separate cultures as well. And I, I wanted to let's say this is about a, a five minute video. I We may go back to it, but I don't think we'll have time. What I do want to share with you is this. And I, I know that you guys can probably see, this is just really irritating, all the ads and everything like that. But what I want to show you, this is something called the Heavenly City Diagram. And when we look at this, um, can you guys see this page that I'm trying to share? Should say heavenly. Okay. Yes. Um, what I want you guys to look at is the geometry behind this, and then try to remember what the Taj Mahal looks like, and some of these other buildings that we've, we've been looking at, and see that the see how it's reflected in it. Uh, Michelangelo, when he built his baptistry, used the same kind of geometry. The, uh, the Mughal emperor um, Shah Jahan used it in the Taj Mahal. And then we also see it in um, much of, of the dome architecture, the central dome architecture that Umar Sinan was doing in um, Ottoman era or in, in the Ottoman Turkey. And what this article, I want you guys to look at this article. And if you guys want to do this as one of your projects, that's just fine. But this is the kind of geometry that we're talking about. And yeah, you see that? It, it's interesting, big deal. What is fascinating to me about this is this geometry was developed not quite independently, but shared within Persia, Turkey, uh, Northern India, and the Renaissance. And it is, it's called the Heavenly City Diagram because it is generated from the description that Paul gave and that John the Revelator gave of the city of heaven. It is also based on Zoroastrian model of the celestial garden. And it was used by uh, the Mughal architects to build the Taj Mahal. And you can see the footprint of the Taj Mahal in this, which I, I think is really interesting. But this gives us references to the Vitruvians circle and square. It also gives us a reference to um, uh, the things like uh, sacred numbers, eight, um, six, eight, ten, as well as seven and twenty-eight, and um, it also gives us uh, a lot of reference to. I'm trying to get rid of that ad. I don't know why it's not. Anyway, anyway, um, it gives us references to a lot of things that are. Uh, used as special points of symbology in the religions that were common to these er that were specific and celebrated in the areas that we looked at among all these cultures. And so I, I think it's it's really fascinating to me that this is a common entity, and we'll see that in many other things. But this article just walks you through how to create this, not with a computer, but with a compass and a straight edge because that's the technology that people had at the time. And uh, 
I would like you guys at the very least to go through this, whether or not you do it yourself, um, just look at it and see how people generated this. And then as you look at the architecture and structures of these different cultures, go back and, and, and briefly look at those modules if, if you'd like, you will see the, this resonating throughout all of these. And I, I'm just going to kind of scroll through this. You know, this, this is 28. Why is 28 and why is seven a sacred number? Why is 28 a sacred number? Do either of you guys know? 28, I'm sorry, Ryan? I imagine, uh, it, you know, 28 because it's divisible by seven somehow, um, but I'm not sure where the lucky number seven comes from. Well, um, seven, and, and the, that's that's really good. Yeah, they are they are sacred. They're they're important. And uh, one of the reasons twenty eight is sacred is it references the moon, and uh, the the. Um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. The menstrual cycle. So it's it's a way of acknowledging, um, if not outright celebrating the the sacred feminine. And uh, it's it's interesting to me. There's, I have spoken with scholars from several different uh, Islamic traditions, and I, I've spoken with um, Christian mystics from several places in the from around the world. And twenty eight becomes a really special number for a lot of reasons. And it, it's interesting to me. And we can go into at some point why. But I, I think that it's, it's an acknowledgement of, I, at least on one level, the sacred symbolism of the moon. And yeah, that necessity of the moon in our lives. Everybody thinks the, the sun is, is um, absolutely intentional, is absolutely necessary for life, and it absolutely is. But the moon also is. And in these kinds of diagrams, when you, when you start dealing with um, spiritual mysticism from several different faiths, these kinds of things show up in the architecture and the artwork because it's an, an acknowledgement that the moon is also absolutely vital. And it's kind of a nod to both men and women being equally important, um, even if they're not equally on display, So, I, which I think is interesting. But seven becomes sacred for Christians because of um, the idea of the Trinity or the message of the, the gospel being shared to the four points of the the four corners of the world or the four, four corners of the map of the world. Um, it becomes sacred because it uh, represents a balance between the three worlds or the three layers of the world and um, the four phases of, of matter or the four elements. And, and so there, there's a lot of uh, mysticism in there as well. And uh, what's interesting about seeing this in this diagram is it's very difficult. And if you guys are interested, I will show you how to do it. It's very difficult to draw a seven pointed star within a circle without the aid of higher order math and computers. But people a thousand years ago were still able to do this or 500 years ago during this time, we're still able to do this. And I think these kinds of geometries demonstrate the cross pollination that people had within their cultures because this information was shared uh, among all those cultures. So take some time, and I would recommend going through and seeing and, and just exploring that article. And I want to, I've been rambling for, for a while, but I also wanted to show uh, this to you as kind of a, a demonstration of a little bit about what's going on with this, this uh, cross-pollination. Does anybody know what this is? This is the tile uh, underneath the throne where the heads of state of England are crowned. Okay, th this is what Charles sat his narrow skinny white butt on when he was crowned as king. I'm sorry, that I shouldn't have said that. Now it's recorded forever. <laughs> but this was made essentially as a, as a present. Uh, it's, it's called the Cosmati Pavement, and it was made in the 13th century as a present for the heads of state of England. And um, 
some of the things that I think are fascinating about this. So this is made at the end of the Crusades, right before um, the Renaissance. And I, I think it's a perfect examination of kind of where people were moving as they moved into the Renaissance. You see examples of a lot of this sacred geometry that people shared. You know, we, we see a Ren is a, um, just kind of a resonance with that city of heaven geometry throughout this. We see some things like, you know, suggestions of the geometry we see in Islamic tiling that informed a lot of what the Italians became famous for with their marquetry, their uh, wood tiling floors and stuff like that. We see sacred shapes that, that come from Jomon, China, or Jomon, uh, Japan, um, stuff that you see in uh, Egyptian work, Moroccan work, stuff that the Romans were doing. And it, it, this is, you know, 700 years old. And I, I think it's uh, appropriate to show it at, at this point, because even though it's not within the, the Renaissance, it's right before the Renaissance. And it kind of gives us an, um, a key as to what kind of things to look for. This is an explanation of how the golden ratio is derived. And again, why am, why am I showing the golden ratio? What, what do we see it resonating it within among the three cultures we looked at? This is the shape of the rectangle that these cultures were referencing when they did things like books and paintings. Not every painting, not every book is going to have this ratio, but this ratio is going to be reflected in like the Shaname paintings. It's going to be reflected in the Ottoman era portraits. It's going to be reflected in the definitions of beauty that were used by the Renaissance masters. And uh, this just shows very quickly how to derive the golden ratio. It's um, you start with a perfect square, make a diagonal from half of one side to the corner, drop that down in an arc. And this rectangle, the ratio is one to 1.618. Or if this long side is one, this is 0.618. And this talks about how that golden ratio references a lot of different things. We can talk to about the um, platonic solids. And what Plato had accidentally backed into is that the points of the platonic solids also represent the um, number of electrons that define the geometry of molecules as atoms connect to each other. That was uh, talked about by, I believe it was, I want to say Dr. Snow in the 1980s. He was one of the founders of nuclear, what became nuclear physics. But um, the platonic solids are the simplest, the five simplest forms that are made by geometric shapes that all ha share the, um, length, the same length of sides. And those shapes are a square, triangle, and a pentagon. And the five uh, platonic solids are a tetrahedron, a cube, an icosahedron, um, an octahedron, and a dodecahedron. And those, the, the points, the corners on them define the number of atoms and the number of electrons and atoms that, that govern how they connect to each other to make molecules. So our universe is constructed. Somehow Plato was able to, to understand this on some level. Our universe is constructed and um, three-dimensional models reflecting the, the golden section. And what's interesting about that is that this reverberates through the artwork of these three cultures that we were seeing. And it really is demonstrated in their artwork during the periods that we've been talking about and exploring. So definitely look at the geometry tutorial. And uh, what is fun about these videos is, well, for me as, as a nerd, is that it really kind of demonstrates how people used these um, geometries 
to derive the the paintings the and the architecture and the sculptures that they created and we're talking about Mughals, uh, Ottomans and the Renaissance. And then this person shows uh, talks about how to make this form with um, it's an eight pointed star that is the compassionate breast star. And then this is uh, based on a pentagram or pentagram uh, reflected on itself or it's the it's also called a decagon you know 10 pointed star this what's really interesting is this is what a dna strand looks like when you look down the center of it you know according to all the models that we have and this particular star i can't remember the exact time period but this is pretty consistent with uh, Safavid era uh, design um, in Persia. And that's maybe seven to 300 years ago. I, I just think it's really fascinating. And then we also see, you know, the, you see these shapes. This is a six pointed star that is uh, made. I think this particular one, yeah, this, this particular one is made for uh, was made for a Christian family by um, an Islamic artist in Ottoman Turkey. And then we have a seven-pointed star, and this is used by uh, Indian alchemists, Turkish alchemists, and uh, European alchemists, all the same, to kind of connect that idea of the, um, the idea of the three realms and the three layers of the universe with the, the entirety of the world. The three layers are the underworld, or the world of death, the mortal world, or the world of salt, and the spiritual realm, or the world of the sky. So I, and I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff fast and furious, but these things, you, you um, when we look at this, go back and examine some of that other stuff, and you can see, like this is another iteration of the Heavenly City diagram, and you can see these iterated in the architecture of the stuff that we've seen. Like looking down on some of the buildings that Mimar Sinan did, you can place the central dome in here and then the supporting domes around it. And it, it's kind of eerie how this seems to be reflected in so many different things. Now, why is all this kind of stuff? It, yeah, it is interesting to think about, but what makes it fascinating to me is these are demonstrations of that kind of cross-pollination. And I want to play um, just some really quick, I have, a couple clips that I want to play for you. And give me just a second to set this up. We're not gonna to listen to the whole thing, so don't worry about that. But I do want to listen to just enough of it that you guys start getting a sense of it. Okay, hold on just a second here. I thought I had set this up, but I had not set it up quite the way that I'd wanted to. Okay, hold on a sec. Sorry about this. Um, as, as I set this up, what do you what do you guys think about the stuff that I showed you? Um, there was something that you showed us. Um, the I already forget what it's called. It's it's the diagram. It has the X and then three dots on each side. And um, I recall going to a, a church in Egypt, and they had a lot of Coptic crosses with, you know, with the, the instead of an X, it was like this, but it had, you know, the three dots in between and also three points um, on each leg of the cross um, for, you know, the cross and then um, uh, disciples. Was that something that, you know, you're saying that symbol goes all the way back to Zoroastrianism. Is that one of the things one of the institutions that um, inspired 
the religious practices that eventually became Christianity? Well, there's um, actually, yes, quite a bit. Um, it, if you uh, do a close examination of some of uh, the doctrinal teachings of, of Christ in the New Testament, he's referencing uh, the traditions of uh, Zoroastrianism that um, the Jews had adopted um, after Moses, which, which is re really fascinating. But there's, there's ideas in there that are also reflected on in um, what was revealed to uh, Muhammad by Gabriel. And I, I would be really hesitant to say that Zoroastrianism influenced so much of the other stuff as, to, as I think it's more appropriate to say things like uh, Zoroastrian reflects, resonates, or foreshadows things. Um, my idea, my ideas about faith is that there are resonances that people, resonances that people respond to, as opposed to folks just coming up with ideas from stuff that other people have already delivered. Because I, I don't think that's how religion is created. I think religion, um, politicized religion is a different matter at all, um, altogether. But I think the spiritual realm is more a uh, manifestation of uh, a consciousness that people tap into as opposed to people plagiarizing earlier work. I, I think that, that is completely inappropriate and it shows no respect for the, the folks that I have um, articulated systems of faith. Because I, I, I think that, do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? I, um, and so when, when we talk about Zoroastrianism, there are elements of that, that go all through these cultures, like the, the three layers of, of the universe, the, uh, the realm of inarticulated drives or the, the realm of, of death, the underworld. Um, that's where the um, evolutionary responses come into play. It's called the, the world of um, sulfur. Then there's the world of salt, the physical realm. That's what we are cognizant of that we live in every day. Uh, this is um, represented by, for example, um, salt. <laughs> of course, that's why it's called the world of salt. But dirt, earth, those kinds of things. And then there's the, the, the realm of aspiration, which is uh, represented by the uh, mercury, the, the idea that somehow the stars um, show us the higher order mind of God, you know, which, which is something that is, is common to all, all these cultures as well. Um, and uh, those three things are prevalent. So yeah, you do see that so showing up in Zoroastrianism and then its echoes also show up in Christianity and um, Islam too, uh, is Islamic expression. And then you get, um, the, the four phases of matter or the, the four um, corners of the world or, you know, this idea that four somehow relates to the expansion of awareness. Um, the, the, you get the, the four elements that everybody thinks that, you know, our ancestors thought were so stupid. That's something that you see in Zoroastrianism, uh, Christianity and Islam as well, you know, in uh, medical sciences of, of the different cultures and things like that. And those are, these are the, the phases of matter. You get the solid state or the, the, the element of earth. You get the, the fluid state or the element of water. You, you get the gaseous state or the element of air. And then you get the plasma state or the element of fire. You know, and it's not, our ancestors weren't stupid. They knew that that was not what everything is comprised of, but those are the states that everything is are comprised of or that you can find in every instance of matter, there's going to be those four states, solid, fluid, gaseous, and plasma. Uh, do, do, do you see what I'm kind of backing into trying to say? I think so. Like, um, and the way that I'm kind of understanding it is that our ancestors kind of recognized that there was more to the world that than, you know, we can just see and an artist might 
a certain type of artist at least might believe that you can tap into the parts that we can't see craft them in this realm and that's going to be comforting to uh to a viewer of your art yeah i i i think so and or communicating somehow that and when you when you go into a religious structure you know a specific a structure that is specifically designed to house uh, spiritual activity or spiritual presence represent that housing um and i'm, I'm talking about like a chapel or a cathedral a, a mosque for example, there is this awareness that um, the person building that is not making a sacred space so much as they are making an environment to remind us that it is intended to be sacred. And what is fascinating to me about that is whether or not the artist is consciously articulating these things. You see the resonance everywhere. You walk into um, like, for example, most of the mosques that were built in, uh, in uh, Persia between about 1450 and 1750, for example, are going to have a very similar model where you're going to have a, a, a very specifically patterned floor. You know, it's a relatively simple tile pattern. You're going to have uh, geometrically patterned uh, wainscoting up to about maybe chest height. Uh, maybe about like that, that uh, it's very geomet geometrically designed and there's a lot of pattern there that it gets, it's very easy to get lost in it, but it's, it hovers around generally very geometric shapes. And then from waist up, up until about maybe 15, 20 feet, you're going to have a lot more organic influence in the geometry and the designs are going to be wild. Then you're going to see almost a clear story of a writing, uh, you know, calligraphy to remind you where you're at. And then above that, the ceiling is going to have even more fantastic writing. And sometimes it will go, the, the um, writing will be at waist level and that organic geometry that's really wild will go all the way up to the ceiling and wrap around. And it seems uh, what's interesting about that is if you go into a sacred space and look down, the floor is designed to not be very complicated and relaxing and comforting. When you sit down and kneel down, what you're looking at is the geometry that helps to pull you away from the ordinary world. You start getting into a meditative state. And as you start reflecting and perhaps your gaze goes up, that's when you start seeing the more fantastic designs. They're just designed to re completely remove you from awareness of your everyday life. And then we, if we go and look at Renaissance architecture, uh, the, like Gothic era cathedrals, what you go in, you, you, you walk into a space, you see tiling, a lot of the times a labyrinth on, on the floor, but the floor is designed around a utilitarian beauty where it's a simple design. You go, you go into that, say, then you get the rich wood wainscoting. You get furniture and stuff up to about waist, chest state. And then, um, a lot of the times, instead of kneeling on the ground, you're sitting in pews and you know you, you get that same kind of thing where your eye line and below where you might be praying, you're looking at natural materials a lot of the times. And then as you sit and start looking up, even though they don't have that fantastic design that the, the Muslim counterparts did, uh, a lot of the times you, you're going to see these um, walls that go into the ceiling that invite your eye to arch up higher and higher and lose yourself in, in the height of the ceiling. And instead of using this incredibly ornate design to kind of capture your, your mind and attention, you are invited to look up and think of the heavens. You know, it, it gets to the same kind of place where you are really detaching from your ordinary mundanity of life and thinking about heaven, just like you're in, you're in the the, the, the worship space of a mosque and you're, you're thinking of the heaven and the ornateness and the infinity of, of creation, it still manages to pull you away from the mundanity of life. And whether or not the individual elements mean the same kind of thing, I think the artists are still trying to, and the designer is still trying to draw you out you know, in this, this sacred space 
That's the same, that's the same kind of, the sacred space performs a similar function for both Muslims and, and Christians. And the artist is still doing the same kind of steps to get you to think of heaven, essentially, and to pull you out of the mundanity of everyday life. So it's not, not quite the same thing, but they're, they're still getting there. And then as you take the time to reflect on things, whether or not the artists are consciously thinking of three layers of the universe, you know, the, the four corners of the world, they are communicating this idea that existence lives on different planes, that we need to be aware on some level that everything isn't um, dependent on whether or not you um, did all your chores today. You know, it's not dependent on the physical world. There are other things to consider. There are other things to think about. Um, uh, you look at the typology of stained glass during the Renaissance, it's designed to make you think of biblical stories. You look at the calligraphy in Ottoman and Mughal India, and it's designed to make you think of, again, scriptural references. You know, it's it's not exactly the same, and all the artists aren't communicating the exact same thing, but it, like you said, it's to help you understand that there's more to the universe than what that the moment. And that, that's why I think it's so fascinating to me to see how these things are expressed among all these different cultures. You know, we get these three different cultures that are finally focusing on stuff other than technology designed to kill each other. They're learning things from each other. They're expressing what they learn in their own ways. And there are a lot of these uh, resonances and parallels that we can see. But it, what it comes down to is that each of these three cultures has developed uh, visual languages to help the individual person appreciate that there is more to life than whether or not your, your quiche was overcooked. <laughs> you know, or whether or not you've taken the selfie with the, the correct background, for example. I, and what I wanted, to, the, the, the snippets that I was trying to pull, uh, let me see if I can uh, get this really quickly. Hold on just a second here. Okay. All right. I want, I want to share this really quick. Um, this is supposed to be Carolingian, which is, we're talking 7th, 8th, 9th century. And this is supposedly what people, how people made music at the time. And I don't know how accurate this is going to be. Uh, as as uh, We're not going to listen to all nine minutes. I just want you to listen to a little bit of it. I think I think that's enough. Um, did, were you guys able to hear that at all? Did you hear that? Okay. Some of the things that I and see if you agree with me. Some of the things that I hear in that is it is relatively simple. It has a fairly um, approachable melody. Whether or not you like it doesn't doesn't matter, but it's simple. It's uh, it it feels. Uh, Digestible, perhaps you know it, it's not really a, a, a challenge there. But um, do, you, do you guys kind of agree with that? Do you kind of you know it, it, it's fairly straightforward? Okay, and then um, I want to. I'm hoping that this is a good example. Let's see. Let's hear this.
Okay, I think I think that's enough of that. What are what is one of the big what are some of the big differences you hear between that and music that was composed 500 years earlier? What are some of the differences you hear right away? How many different instruments are there? There's a lot of them in the in the newer one, in the more recent one. Yeah, I, I count at least five different instruments. Uh, two different strings, cymbals, drum, and uh, then like a really nasally flute. And in, in the earlier one, the Carolingian, it was very simple, very straightforward. The and, latter one uh, seems almost cinematic. Yeah, uh, there, there's more going on. There's, there's different, there's different uh, lines of, of, of harmony or different lines of melody, you know, and it, they're starting to play with each other a little bit. Now, I want to, to play something else. And I, um, this is, it should be understood, this is not music. But this is something that the people that wrote the Carolingian music, you know, their descendants would have heard the first time when they went um, on a crusade. Okay, I think that that's enough to kind of demonstrate what, I, what I'm trying to um, illustrate. This, the, the person, the muezzin is, their voice has kind of a, an interesting resonance that is not what Europeans were used to. The, um, the melody, if, if you can call it that, this isn't music, this is recitation, but the melody is um, has a lot more different twists and turns to it than the, that Carolingian stuff did. There's a little bit more going on. It's it's a little bit more complicated. And I'm thinking that you know if we listen to this stuff, and if we listen to this stuff. The biggest difference between the in the time spans between these two styles of music was the encounter, the encountering of this. Is it just me or can you guys hear the, the call to prayer being echoed a little bit in the Renaissance music? Can you kind of hear that little bit of influence coming in? There, there's, there's a little bit going on there. What is really fascinating to me is that the reed flute was in, um, that nasal reed flute was encountered during the Crusades. The, the, the symbols were encountered during the Crusades. That kind of little bit of resonance to the drum, where it's actually that additional sound comes because there's strings wrapped around the drum and they resonate with the drum head. That was encountered during the, the, um, the Crusades. And having the competing voices, all the different languages that were spoken in the streets of the areas that they went through, that was encountered during the Crusades. So I I, I think that the I I think that that music, the, the way that the Renaissance music starts to sound, is evidence of that kind of cross-pollination awareness as well. Because I think it seems to come from the stuff that those people encountered and then brought back home with them, and which I, I think is interesting. And I had uh, a friend named Latif Bolat who does a lot of historical music in uh, Turkey. One of the things that he said is that, you know, the lute, which is, it's actually an oud is what the actual name is. And when Europeans were encountering, uh, you know, they asked somebody, what's that called? And they say, el oud. They, they would just hear lute. They didn't hear the oud, which is, is what the word is. And, um, but he said that there are, I think he said like 247 different specific ways that you could set the frets on a lute to get all the different cording. 
and the different sets come from the Turkish musicians encountering people all around them from Europe to India and North Africa. And uh, every time they would come home, they would set the frets differently to kind of mimic the music that they heard in the place that they came from so that they could bring those that cording back home to Turkey. You know, and they're, they're, the evolution of Turkish music during the Ottomans reflects directly the cross-pollination that they had. What do you think was going on with India in India with the Mughals? The same kind of thing. They were getting all these instruments in too, and the music starts changing as well. And I and I think that, that that's one of the things that we're we're kind of seeing. Anyway, I've I've gone on for long enough. You guys have been very patient. Thank you very much for not complaining. Do you guys have any questions or observations about the kind of stuff that we looked at this week? Yes. Um, so I noticed it, it's actually about Canvas. Um, I was trying to find the page to that you were on to try to follow along, and I was clicking around, and I I, I, I didn't see it. Um, I, and that, you know, it's probably just me not <laughs> doing it right. But where exactly in Canvas are we? Okay, let's let me share you with you. It's not showing up for me either. Oh, crap. OK. OK, now refresh your pages and see. Is it showing up now? It's showing up for me. OK. That is my fault. I am so sorry. I, I had done. I had um, published everything, and then somehow it reset. So yet nothing was published. So that is my fault. So um, I'm going to do a page share really quick. I, we are going over. Let me do this really fast. Okay, this is the module, and. Um, the dates on here, um, I will have to reset the dates. I don't, I, I don't know why it does this every once in a while. I'm going to blame it on the on Canvas because I know it's not me. But the two pages we looked at were European Mughal and Ottoman cross pollination, and this should actually be um, yesterday's date, or I mean, so, sorry, the 16th. And this should actually be the 16th. So I don't know why it reset those dates. And I'm really sorry that it was um, it had unpublished. I because I remember publishing all that for you guys last week. I'm so sorry. It, does, does that help now? You guys can see it? OK. All right. All right. Any other questions or observations? Thank you, Ryan. That was very helpful. And it made me feel a lot less stupid now. Kind of. I still feel dumb. But uh, all right, well, guys, if you have any other questions or anything like that, any uh, questions about uh, whether or not a project is appropriate to the class, let me know too. But I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Thank you so much for your patience. Sorry for going over. I just get excited about some of this stuff. And I will look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. Have a great weekend.